Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, it's good to be here. I appreciated those hands going up. Um, I took that as an affirmation. I uh, want to thank a number of folks here. Um, first of all, beginning with Gary Shapiro and really all of the CTA. It's a great organization uh, and does a great job. And Gary, as many of you know, is constantly on fire. Um, and he has pledged to me that his next task is he's going to learn Mandarin by the end of next year when I come back for this. Um, also really want to um, uh, uh, acknowledge a number of the elected officials. This has really been an all-star day that uh, the CTA has put together. Um, I know later today you're going to have Congresswoman uh, Dobene, who's going to be speaking, uh, Congressman Issa from my home state of California, uh, Congressman Moulton from uh, Massachusetts, who's continued his distinguished service for our country. Uh, earlier today, uh, Congressman uh, Brooks and Chairwoman Fox, who I was very excited to hear, uh, is actually an Airbnb host. I'll actually have a little bit more to say about that because it matches up with something I'll be talking about. And here in the audience, uh, we have a number of uh, my colleagues uh, from Airbnb. Uh, over here, we have um, Casey Eden Wansbury, who oversees our federal affairs, formerly chief of staff for a Democratic Senate member. I think Megan McKenna is here somewhere. And right over there, um, out of the House, where she was a chief of staff for a Republican member, uh, we have Clark Stevens, who oversees our strategic partnerships. Um, I think Janae Ingram is here as well, who just came over to us from the National Action Network. Excited to have her join. And uh, Will the Thrill Burns, a former alderman from Chicago who's now here in Washington, D.C., helping us here in the district. So really excited to have my colleagues here. Um, what I'm going to share uh, today uh, is a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to talk about how our platform actually promotes and supports uh, economic empowerment. I know a thematic of this conference. Um, and there's really three pieces or three elements that go into that that I'll talk about. Uh, the first uh, is really the big changes that are taking place in our world. Uh, I know many of you in the room know about these and spend a lot of time talking about them. Uh, but those changes have come together and actually helped produce the sharing economy, and in particular, Airbnb. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, the value proposition, proposition, specifically how we're using our People for People platform to promote uh, economic empowerment for people. Um, so as we look out there, we see our world changing in pretty significant ways. Uh, and we see really five big factors driving those socioeconomic structural changes. The first and one that, again, people in this room know very, very well is our technologies are changing. Uh, in that handheld device that hopefully you're not texting with as I speak, but that's okay if you are, um, there's now infinitely more power than was in the Apollo 11 spacecraft that took humanity to the moon for the first time. And not just a little bit more power, but enormous computing power is actually in the handheld device uh, that you have. And as we go forward, that is also being com complemented by the spread of the internet. Today, 40% of folks have access to broadband. About 75% have access to mobile devices. And really, over the next 10 years, you're going to have a scenario where everyone has access to broadband, everyone has access to mobile devices. And really, at least arguably since humankind left the old divide gorge, for the first time, humanity is actually able to be connected in a global way. Anyone can be collected with anyone, anywhere. Um, and the, co the combination of both uh, the power of computing that you can put into your handheld device and uh, the ability to have this global network has produced these so-called network platforms. Uh, and these are powerful platforms, often two-sided marketplaces uh, that represent specific economic spaces. But you've got the infrastructure of computing power just increasing on an almost daily basis, and then the superstructure of a network grid that has allowed these platforms to really flourish. And to put that a little bit in perspective, uh, here is a list of the top five companies in 2001. Uh, you see one tech company in there, Microsoft, uh, but the others are sort of the more industrial age type of companies and financial services. Uh, and then in 2006, five years later, again, pretty similar mix. 2011, you see a new one that emerges, which is Apple, one of the first platform companies. And now today, in 2016, in about a 15-year period, the five largest companies in the world are all network-based platforms. Um, and these platforms are bringing tremendous things to society. They're enhancing our daily lives. They're enriching our experiences. They are connecting us. They're increasing productivity. Uh, and there's more right on the horizon. Soon you're going to have your pizzas delivered by drones. Uh, you're going to be able to enter virtual worlds through VR, particularly augmented VR. 
If you're in LA, you can take a 35 minute ride to San Francisco on the Hyperloop, and to get to the Hyperloop station, you'll go in a driverless car. That's the world that's coming to us and around the corner, and perhaps the biggest one of them all will be the arrival uh, of the robots. AI, machines, robotics, uh, that is obviously a huge wave, and I know something that is a big part of the conversation at this conference. Second big change is our people are changing. Uh, the millennial generation represents the largest generation <clears throat> in human history, uh, bigger than even the baby boomers. And when you combine them with Generation Z, which is coming right behind them, uh, this is gonna be the dominant generation when it comes to culture, when it comes to business and consumer choices, when it comes to politics. Uh, and this is not really an abstract concept. It's actually happening as we speak. You know, today, those millennials represent the plurality of the American workforce. And to get a sense of what their heft is gonna be over the next 10 years, uh, think about the fact that they'll represent about half of all voters over the next 10 years, assuming that they vote, uh, and over 75% of the key consumer demographic. Uh, so these, this generation is going to be making the choices on politics, culture, which businesses in, succeed, which consumer products are embraced. And this is a generation that does think about things in a different way. Uh, they're very mission-oriented, values-driven, uh, three out of four millennials would rather spend their resources on an experience than necessarily a material gain, something very different than the baby boomer generation. And the way they look at it, and this is something that we take very, very seriously, the way they look at businesses and companies, uh, they do think um, your mission, your social impact uh, ought to be part of how a company is evaluated, not just uh, whether it's financially successful or not. And one way that you really see these attitudes manifesting themselves uh, is where uh, these folks are choosing to live. Uh, more and more, they are making the decision to live in cities. Um, globally, you are now seeing, really for the first time, uh, more people moving into cities uh, than into the country. Uh, we've seen an explosion in the number of cities uh, that are over a million people globally, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, over 60% of the U.S. population now lives in cities. Again, a lot of this is being driven by millennials choosing to move to urban areas because they're driven by a, a desire to have uh, experiences. Um, and, you know, one real stat that sort of makes this clear is that in the U.S. today, we now have as many people moving into the cities as the suburbs. It's the first time that's happened since the 1930s. The third big change out there is our climate is changing. Uh, 15 of the last 16 years have been the hottest on record. Uh, 2016 was the hottest ever recorded. Uh, and what that is doing for these millennials who are growing up in this time period is it's impacting their fundamental perspective on the world. Uh, this is a generation that does believe that this is a significant issue by a significant uh, uh, delta between them and baby boomers, about 25 point difference in terms of how they look at this issue uh, versus boomers. And as they move into the cities, uh, that's impacting how these cities are conducting themselves. Uh, sustainability, the concept of sharing resources has become front and center in terms of how cities are sort of organizing themselves. A real sense uh, from this generation that there's a need to be codependent and interdependent. Uh, and particularly as it relates to how do you make sure you're maximizing the utility of an asset. Uh, you see that with shared cars, you see that with shared housing, uh, but it's expanded even beyond that. You now have shared gardens, shared tools, shared food, shared electricity, even shared pets. I think Harry Truman said that in Washington, D.C., don't get a friend. If you want a friend, get a dog. Well, you can actually now share that dog in Washington, D.C., apparently. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, think about, you know, this importance of trying to maximize the value of, a, of an underutilized asset. Uh, in the U.S., there's over 12 million empty homes. Uh, in the U.S., there's over 33 million empty bedrooms. Uh, again, thinking about how those millennials think about these issues. The fourth major change is travel uh, is changing. This is the ship that brought uh, my grandparents from Naples, Italy to uh, Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty. Uh, it took them about 14 days to make that trip. Uh, today, with the advent of air travel, uh, you can make that trip in about eight or nine hours, depending on the headwinds. Uh, and what that has really driven is an inexorable growth uh, in travel. Uh, over three billion people traveled by air last year. Uh, over a billion people uh, traveled internationally. Uh, it's, dri it's driving a tremendous and continuing, continuously accelerating growth in travel and tourism. Uh, you saw that uh, over the last couple of years. The hotel industry uh, has had record profits, record growth over the last three years, even as Airbnb has exploded onto the scene. Uh, and today, travel and tourism represents around 10% of the global GDP. <clears throat> Uh, it's bigger than big oil. 
Uh, one in 10 jobs globally are connected to travel and tourism. Similar stats exist here in the United States. We have a little bit more of a diversified economy, uh, but about 8% of our GDP is connected to travel and tourism. And 14.2 uh, million jobs, over 9% of the jobs in the US have a connection to travel and tourism. Uh, and speaking of the economy, that really takes us to our fifth um, and final big structural change going out there, uh, which is our economy is shifting. We've gone from an industrial age where people worked on the factory floor uh, to an information age uh, where people are working in shared workspaces. Uh, and this is not the first time our country has gone through a type of economic change like this driven by technology that then has an impact on the dynamics of society. If you look back sort of beginning of the 1800s, shortly after the uh, formal founding of our country, we've had these 50-year cycles where the economy has gone through shifts. Uh, in the 1800s, new technology in terms of harvesting and farming uh, allowed for agriculture to really flourish. It then drove Western expansionism uh, here in the United States. Uh, and then with the rise of steam power, uh, you had the pre-industrial age and cities began to form uh, around waterways in the United States. And then with the advent of electricity, you had an enormous industrial boom, particularly in the big core urban markets, which then in turn attracted immigrants, particularly from Southern Europe. Um, and then after World War II, the accessibility of the automobile uh, helped spread people out into the suburbs. Uh, well, we're at the front end of the latest trend, and that is this digital era. Uh, and it is an era uh, where the frontier now is people's ability to connect with folks all over the world, over their devices, and through technology. Um, and you're seeing how that now is reflecting in just actual structural workplace. Uh, we live in a time period where more and more people are working from home or working from mobile locations. The majority of the companies in the US now have employees that work from places other than their workplace. You're also just seeing it in terms of who people are working for. You know, there was a time when people would typically work for one employer over the course of their lifetime. Now more and more people are working for multiple folks. Increasingly, people are becoming freelancers. Um, almost 40% of millennials uh, work as freelancers that generates about $715 billion um, in economic activity uh, through their work. Uh, and a lot of them really enjoy it. They can be a freelancer at Etsy by day and then pursuing their musical or artistic career uh, by night. Um, but as we all know, and as we saw in the previous transitions, there's always challenges um, when you go through a major economic transition, particularly one that's being driven by technological changes. Uh, I think one of the areas that we have really focused on is the relationship between technology driving productivity and what's happening with wages. Uh, typically, uh, in the past, when technology came in and increased productivity, wages would mirror that. Uh, but in this age, uh, we're not necessarily seeing that same relationship. In fact, productiv productivity continues to go up while wages remain stagnant. Uh, and it's particularly stagnant in a couple specific uh, subsectors within the country. Uh, the first is what is uh, considered or thought of as manual workers, people who may be uh, on a, in a factory or on an assembly line, uh, typically doing routine manual labor. Uh, the second is with those who are um, doing routine cognitive work that could be uh, uh, an x-ray technician, it could be an insurance adjuster, and God forbid it could even be a lawyer. Um, but in both of those sectors, you have seen um, a real stagnation in terms of wages going, uh, not going up and keeping pace uh, with the rise of productivity. On the other hand, you've seen some sectors that have gone up, the creative class, those people who are doing coding, uh, they have seen their wages go up. And you've also seen wages continue to go up uh, at the lower end, um, uh, 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 non-routine manual work. So you can't necessarily go to a Starbucks and ask a, uh, a computer or a robot to give you an off-the-menu uh, coffee, right? You actually need a barista who will do that. So in those two sectors, you've seen wages continuing to go up. But really, if you sort of drill down, at least from our perspective, you know, one of the core issues driving the uh, conversation about economic inequality or the dwindling middle class really focuses on those two in the middle who have seen their wages uh, stagnate. And this is something that we really think that, uh, that, that we need to think about and that uh, Airbnb in particular can play a real role in. Now, as challenging as that is, I think everyone in this room is spending time thinking about this issue. Uh, we have a bigger transition coming right behind that, and that really is the rise of the robots. Uh, you know, there are some studies that show over the next 10 or 20 years, almost 50% of all jobs could be displaced or replaced. Um, for every robot that comes on, you lose six jobs that are being uh, now run or occupied by humans. Uh, this is a challenge for everyone in society. Uh, I think it's a particular challenge for those of us who are in the tech community, particularly those with these large 
significant platforms, we have a responsibility to address it. And I think there's a real responsibility to work uh, with the technology community, to work with those leaders in Washington, D.C. on this issue. And I think it's a great role that CTA really plays. Gary, <coughs> you guys do a great job in actually brokering these conversations, and it's a really valuable tool for all of us. Um, but you put all of those dynamics together, and really catalyzed by the recession in 2008, when middle class people were scrambling um, to help make ends meet, and boom, you get the sharing economy. Uh, and the sharing economy is actually really bifurcated into two real specific sectors. Uh, the first is shared labor, uh, and the other one is shared capital. Shared labor is someone who may be using their actual physical labor to drive a car. Shared capital is when you're taking an asset that you control and trying to find ways to maximize the value of it. Uh, that's what home sharing is. Uh, and if you were going to look at the beginning of home sharing or, or where it really began over a digital platform, you'd go to this address in Rouse Street in San Francisco in 2008. Two of our three founders um, were recent art school graduates. They were, all three of them are millennials. They were scrambling in 2008 to make their own rent. And there was an art conference taking place in San Francisco, and they came up with this idea of making available some air sofa mattresses, uh, orange juice, bagels, coffee, uh, for a couple people to spend the weekend in their apartment so that they could make their rent. They listed the air mattresses on a listserv, uh, were able to make their rent, and came up with an idea. Uh, how about making uh, bedrooms in other homes available over a website? And so they launched this in 2009. Um, and from bedrooms, you soon were listing whole homes that were not being occupied. And then from there, you got tree houses. Um, you could even get an igloo if you're interested. And uh, if you were so interested and wanted to travel to Transylvania on Halloween last year, you could have rented Count Dracula's castle. Um, so you know, since our founding in 2009, uh, we've been blessed with incredible uh, growth, a chart that you will see lighting up behind me. Each of those lights lighting up basically represents someone who has traveled uh, on Airbnb. And what we benefit from is something called the network effect. One person travels, they go back and tell someone else. Two people travel, four people travel, eight people travel. Uh, and you can see how this has all added up. You know, today, uh, we're in 191 countries, often easier to identify the places uh, we're not in, Syria, Crimea, Sudan, Iran, North Korea, Clark has volunteered to be our first to go to North Korea. <laughs> That's a joke. Don't tweet that out. That was not, that was not, that was not serious. <laughs> um, uh, we're in 65,000 plus cities. That keeps me pretty busy. Uh, and we have 160 million people who have traveled uh, on the platform. Uh, and we think it's pretty interesting that you have this number of people who are traveling uh, in an era when trust is generally being degraded across all aspects of society. I think we all recognize, appreciate, understand that for a strong functioning society, you do need higher levels of trust. And we do think that there is something going on on our platform when you have strangers staying in a stranger's home. We actually see on our platform that levels of trust between humans is actually going up. 70% of the people who travel on Airbnb do so based on the recommendation of a friend or family member. And really, a proof point of that is what happened on New Year's Eve uh, of this past year. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, we set a record uh, for any type of an accommodation company. Uh, around 2 million people spent the night in a stranger's home on Airbnb. Uh, and in an era when people are really challenged with trust, uh, we do think that part of the power of a platform is actually enhancing and increasing trust. Now, our base of support is really three uh, specific constituencies. Uh, the first is we started with millennials. They were our initial adopters. 60% of the people who travel on Airbnb today are millennials. Uh, and millennials, not surprisingly, strongly support uh, the right of people to share their homes. At this point, I always remind anyone who's an elected official that they're going to be half of all voters, um, and they do care about this issue. Uh, the second uh, 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 stakeholder or constituency group, uh, interestingly, is women. Uh, women represent 55% of all the hosts on the Airbnb platform. They've made $10 billion since the platform was launched. And what's particularly interesting about that, at least from our perspective, is that in most economic sectors or segments, uh, men tend to be the dominant player unless you get to lower economic sectors. You know, on Airbnb, it's actually the women who are the majority uh, of the earners um, and are people who really sort of adopted and embraced it from a host perspective. Um, and then the third category uh, of uh, sort of our constituency is this growing urban middle class um, host constitu constituency. Um, our three million plus hosts are disproportionately from urban areas, uh, disproportionately middle class families. 
Um, and they really do depend on the income that they make from being an Airbnb host to help make ends meet. But when you put those middle class hosts together with our travelers, you can see that our community is starting to get really, really, really big. Um, you know, in a number of our more mature markets, we have over 20% of the entire population uh, of that particular city on the platform. In the country of Australia, almost 20% of the entire population uh, of Australia is on the platform. Here in Washington, D.C., you know, almost uh, a little bit over one in five people are on the platform. Uh, but what we're seeing, and this has really happened over the last year and a half, two years, is that we've begun to expand beyond even these three core constituencies. Uh, over the last year in particular, we've seen enormous growth in rural markets. Um, and I'll come back to that and explain it in a little bit, but well over 100%, in some places, over 200% year-over-year growth uh, as our community has really begun to expand. Now, for us to continue to be blessed with this type of growth, we do need to fundamentally deliver on a social value proposition. And for us, that is really providing economic empowerment. And we see ourselves doing that in three ways. And by the way, this tracks back a little bit to that point I made earlier about how those millennials look at companies and businesses. Do they think that they're doing something good for the world you know, or not? We do believe part of the magic in terms of the growth that we've enjoyed does relate to this, that millennials do recognize this as a different type of a platform that is contributing in a real uh, significant material way economically. And so there's three ways that we do it. Uh, the first is we empower communities uh, by leveraging travel. Um, you know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, if you were the son of the aristocrats in England and you were graduating from a Cambridge or Oxford, you would typically expand and extend your education by do, doing something called the Grand Tour, where you would travel around Europe, staying in people's homes. Uh, well, Airbnb is designed to do that, but really for middle class people who want to travel. One in three folks who travel on Airbnb uh, would not have traveled or would not have traveled as long, but for Airbnb, uh, almost 90% of them uh, stay in places that are non-traditional hotel districts. Uh, to give you a sense of how this plays out, this is Washington, D.C. Uh, the green dots uh, represent the hotels in Washington. You can see they're located in what are typically the hotel districts down around the mall in the capital. Uh, the red dots right here represent the 6,000 plus Airbnb hosts in Washington, D.C. Um, and then this next slide shows you Southeast DC. I think many folks here know of area in, this, in the district that has historically been underserved. It's probably really hard to see, but there's three green dots, meaning three hotels in that entire district uh, and close to 300 Airbnb listings um, in Southeast DC. And it's not only the availability uh, of, of our listings, it's the cost of our listings. Uh, uh, during the inaugural for a typical hotel room in Washington DC, it cost about $335 a night, uh, and Airbnb cost about $139 a night. So at some level, people do vote with their wallet on this, and at some level, people are choosing it because of the availability. Earlier, I had showed the, um, our growth in the rural states, uh, and that's a function at some level of the fact that there simply aren't hotel availability in those markets. Airbnb is filling a hole, filling a gap uh, in those markets where there currently aren't hotels supporting the economy. Airbnb hosts are. The second uh, deliverable for us is really uh, helping to empower families by leveraging homes. Uh, in most capitalist structures, it's the entity at the top that controls the supply chain that most, makes the, most, the vast majority of the wealth being created, regardless of who's actually responsible for the wealth creation. The platform model is much more circular. Uh, an Airbnb host makes 97% of the money of which they list their home for. And so how does that translate? Well, here in Washington, uh, nationally, a typical host uh, rents their home about 41 times a year. They make 97% of the money, uh, and a typical host is making about $6,000 a year. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., which is a particularly good market for us because of the nature of the government workers and, uh, and how the breaks work here, a uh, typical host does it about 60 times a year. Uh, they're keeping 97% of the money uh, and making about $5,800 a year. Again, I think both of those numbers, the 6,000 and the 5,800, make the point that this is people making supplemental income uh, on top of their regular income. And earlier I had talked about women being a key constituency. Well, our fastest growing cohort of hosts are actually senior women. Uh, I was particularly interested in hearing from the congresswoman who uh, reflects uh, a trend that we're seeing out there uh, which is senior women in particular are really embracing being Airbnb hosts. We did a study about a year ago with the AARP to take a look at why this was happening. Uh, not surprisingly, you have a lot of seniors who are on fixed incomes. Uh, they need the money. A typical senior host is making over $8,000 a year. Uh, it's about a 50% bump on what they would make on their social security. Uh, but they also really benefit 
from the social connections, right? They have empty bedrooms, uh, sometimes they're traveling themselves, and they're really benefiting from this network where they're actually meeting and inter engaging with folks. I love the concept of senior women hosting these millennials who are traveling around the world. Uh, but even stepping back from there, you know, earlier I had talked about the challenges that we saw with wage stagnation, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, those workers in the middle. Um, really, if you sort of track back to, from 2008 to today, a uh, typical middle class family in the U.S. is around $4,000 behind from where they would have been if typical growth rates had continued. With the typical Airbnb host making about $6,000, we're helping to make up that gap. I want to be clear, we are not the solution to economic inequality or the dwindling middle class, but we do believe we're part of a solution and part of a model that I think is very informative as we begin to try to address some of these structural issues in our economy. And then the third um, big deliverable for us within our economic empowerment value, social value proposition is empowering Main Street uh, by leveraging the travel wallet. So people travel. On Airbnb, they spend more of their, uh, of their money actually in the community than if they were staying at a hotel. 50% of the money an Airbnb person spends actually stays in the community. That has an impact both on the velocity and the multiplier uh, of those dollars. And you can see that in particular in terms of its impact on local restaurants. We did a study last year showing that in about 36 of our largest markets, uh, we generated over $4.5 billion for local restaurants. Um, and about a month ago, we released a study uh, that looked at the number of jobs that we supported in 2000, globally. In 2016, we supported about 730,000 jobs globally. This year, we'll support about 1.3 million jobs. And to be clear, what that means is that if there's a corner restaurant uh, somewhere here in Washington, D.C., and they typically have 10 people working for them, but the Airbnb traffic that's now coming to that neighborhood allows them to hire 11 or 12 people. You know, that's an example of how we're supporting jobs. And today, we're actually releasing data showing specifically how many jobs Airbnb supported in the United States. Uh, and over the course of 2016, we supported 134,000 jobs all across the country, uh, including significant numbers in places like New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Austin. Um, and so, you know, the Airbnb traveler is spending in a way that is actually helping to support jobs in the United States in addition to the typical $6,000 that, thank you. Now, home sharing uh, is not new. Uh, home sharing over a digital platform uh, is new. Um, and, you know, I was a history major in college, and I've looked back uh, at history to sort of get examples of when we've gone through transitions. And I think one that's particularly relevant is what happened when we transitioned into the electrical age. Uh, when electricity was first developed by George Westinghouse and Nikola Tesla, it was arguably one of the first technologically-based network grids. Uh, but there was an interesting transition. Uh, cities initially opposed the uh, introduction of electricity. They thought it was going to make cities less safe. Think about that. Light would make cities less safe. They then tried to apply the gas lamp laws to uh, this new technology, completely different type of technology. And then the robber barons who controlled the energy that supported the gas lamp industry tried to pass laws to stop electricity from being introduced. You know, from the perspective of today, it seems a little ridiculous, but that is exactly a fight that took place over a 10 or 20 year period uh, in the United States. And what it really tells you is that new things take time to learn. Governments typically apply old laws to a new thing, and incumbent players always resist. So how do we make this work for everyone? Well, we really have a three-step plan. Uh, first is we focus on educating. Uh, we talk um, uh, with opinion elites and opinion leaders like yourselves in this room. We share data. We talk with the media. Uh, secondly, we're committed to proactively working with government. We do believe you need rules, just new rules for a new thing. When you went from the horse and buggy to the car, you needed new rules. Uh, and we do that through something called the Airbnb Policy Compact, where we committed to three things uh, to help sure shape our relationships. One, sharing data with government so they can see the impact in their markets. Two, helping to evolve policy with creative solutions. And three, paying our fair share of taxes. Uh, today in the United States, uh, in about uh, half the markets that we're in, we're actually collecting and remitting uh, hotel and tourist taxes. Uh, at the end of last year, we released something called the Airbnb Policy Tool Chest, which reflected different partnerships that we've put in place all over the world. And this tool chest has really served as a vehicle for other cities to be able to see what's working, take some of the best models, and apply it to themselves. And as we stand here today, we currently have over 300 partnerships globally. Uh, we actually put 50 partnerships in place specifically in the first quarter uh, of this last year with people being able to access this policy tool chest. And so we continue to accelerate the pace of our partnerships. The second thing, uh, third thing that we do is we really uh, do work with um, our community. Our community is something that we call the Airbnb citizen. Uh, they're very, very, very uh, much connected to us, uh, in part for the reasons that we've talked about. They really have a deep connection to us 
uh, on the economics and a deep connection to us on the social connections. Uh, but we've worked with our community to create something called home sharing clubs. Uh, uh, over the course of 2016 and the first part of this year, we've created 140 home sharing clubs uh, globally uh, around the world. Uh, and these are exactly what they sound like, hosts who are coming together uh, to advocate uh, on behalf of themselves, advocate on behalf of home sharing, advocate uh, on behalf of Airbnb, and they do follow the African proverb, they do vote with their feet. Uh, the level of activity that they did just last year alone um, in the US in terms of uh, engaging politically was incredible. Over 4,000 people actually appeared and testified, put themselves into the political arena and participated in the political process. Almost 70,000 political actions taken by this community. And you know, at the end of 2016, there was a real telling stat that came out that I think sort of explains why they're so active. Um, YouGov did a study of the biggest brand advocates in the world. They looked at the biggest companies out there and Airbnb rated number one ahead of some pretty uh, historic and really incredible companies. And again, that relates to the fact that they do connect with us in a really incredible way because of the economics and because of the social connections. By the 20, end of 2018, our goal is to have a thousand of these home sharing clubs uh, running globally. So what's next? I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. But at the end of last year, Brian Chesky, our co-founder and CEO, talked about that Airbnb was gonna evolve from a homes platform to an end-to-end -end trip platform so that you would go on the Airbnb app and be able to figure out how you're gonna travel somewhere, where you're gonna stay, presumably our homes, who you're gonna spend time with while you're there, uh, and most interestingly, uh, at least as of right now, what you're gonna do when you're there, and this is what we call experiences. Uh, and experiences is using the platform so that when you as a traveler are traveling to a particular city, you can connect with someone in that city who is able to give you something that's unique and special about that city. So if you're traveling to Tokyo and you're interested in the history of the samurai, uh, sword warrior. You can actually do a day-long event with a samurai sword artist um, and learn how to develop, build an actual samurai sword and learn the history through that. If burlesque dancing is your thing, you can go to Paris, do a day-long course on burlesque dancing, and by the end of it, actually per participate in a real live burlesque show. Uh, and if you're a runner and you want to really test your mettle, you can go to Kenya and work out with the elite Kenyan runners. I just came back from Rio uh, and did a series of experiences over about 24, 48 hours. Um, it began with um, a gastro pub tour uh, with a columnist from the local paper. By the way, how cool is it in Rio that they actually have a columnist whose beat is to cover the gastro pubs? Tells you a lot about what you need to know about Rio. Uh, I went dancing that night. Uh, hopefully these pictures really do not go much farther than here. Um, I got up the next morning and did boxing on the beach. I had boxed as a kid, so my boxing was a little bit better than my dancing. But after all of that, I certainly need to be redeemed. And we went to Christ the Redeemer and actually had a private tour of Christ the Redeemer at night. It was very mystical, the fog was there. It was an incredibly special 24, 36 hours uh, in Rio, but I left having a much deeper understanding of the city. Um, and so at the end of the day, what our experiences platform is really about is allowing travelers to connect with the greatest natural resource that a city has, using technology to connect you with the greatest natural resource any city has, and that's its people. Um, we talked earlier about the challenge of robotics and the displacing and replacing of humans. Uh, well, the Airbnb platform and part of our empowerment theory of the case here is that we're a platform that's actually using technology to connect humans to humans, uh, to create opportunities for humans, to enhance opportunities for humans. And if you take a big, big step back, you know, what we're going through is not that different than what we've seen in other times. Every society goes through transformations. Again, we've seen those almost every 50 years uh, in the United States. You have to create new approaches and new rules as you go through these transformations. Uh, the status quo almost always uh, resists, uh, but those who want change harness the winds of change. They organize themselves, they create a movement. Um, and our era really is no different. What we're going through is no different. That's why I like to paraphrase the Victor Hugo line that this is an idea so big that no special interest army can really stop it. Uh, at the end of the day, our world is changing. Um, Airbnb has a role to play in it. It's not the answer, uh, but we can provide part of the answer. Uh, and we're really governed by a series of basic principles that uh, we adhere to. Uh, we want to empower communities by leveraging travel, making sure it benefits entire communities. We want to empower families uh, by taking what is typically their greatest expense, the cost of their housing, and using it to generate that supplemental income at a time where wages are stagnating. And we want to empower Main Street uh, by leveraging tourism uh, so that you're actually helping to support the small businesses that exist in those communities. And we're ultimately doing that via a platform that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, and so that anyone can belong anywhere. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Gary. Thanks for putting a great show.